Hey guys, if you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's simply the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor by Spotify has everything you need all in one place. So let me explain. Now, Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your own cell phone or your own computer. Now, I've been using and loving Anchor by Spotify for two years now. And don't forget that Anchor will go ahead and distribute your podcast on so many listening platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts and so many, many more. Now, I think it's simply everything you need to make your own podcast all in one place. And don't forget, Anchor is totally free. So why don't you go ahead and download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. I can't wait to hear all of your podcasts. Hey everyone, welcome back to all my listeners. This is episode number nine of season eight. Today is Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. My name is Sonal Patel, and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. Now, all right, you guys, so it's a brand new month of March, right? Today is March 1st. What's that phrase that we learned when we were kids in school? Something like, March is in like a lion, out like a lamb. I don't know. I have no idea if that's right, but I definitely do believe that we need a quiet month. Don't you? Last month unleashed a whole lot worldwide, and I think we could all use a break. All right, then, you guys, maybe you guys have some spring break plans or something else in this month of March to look forward to. But oh my goodness, I never forget my month of March because it's always filled with March Madness basketball. Well, no, that's not quite true, right? I think we did miss one year of March Madness because of the pandemic, right, that we're still in. But I was heartbroken that first year that we had no March Madness. Um, I don't even know why, but it's my favorite sport to watch. I love filling out those brackets and win. Okay, okay, no, but so I don't actually win and my brackets bust pretty early, but whatever. I still love my March Madness, so I'm looking forward to that in a couple of weeks. Anyways, you guys, let's get into it. So in today's Newsworthy, it's another day of extra news. So my Newsworthy grab bag is where I'll highlight the fact that March is dedicated to MS awareness, and the breaking news related to the No Surprises Act. And then I'll be focusing in on my compliance tips and recommendations today in Trusty Tip, and I'll be diving into the second CBR for the year. That's right, so stay tuned for that Trusty Tip because this CBR is a juicy one. And of course, I'll go ahead and round out today's episode in Spark with a remarkable quote on creativity by Dorothy Parker. If you guys have checked me out on LinkedIn, you know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and our valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organizations, to want to dive in deeper, to use my tips and best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve coding accuracy as you help all your providers paint the medical picture. If you like what you're hearing, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss another episode. Please write in a review and kindly drop me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to my podcast. I really love your support. And as always, a friendly disclaimer, remember I'm bringing you the news, current healthcare industry news, my compliance tips and my compliance recommendations based on my over 12 years of experience in front office, in back end, in coding, and in billing for multi-specialty physicians, in compliance, and in auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. These are my opinions alone and are not to be construed as legal advice. Today's episode is sponsored by Advanced Coding Services, a leading medical billing and medical coding school in the United States. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned professional, our training equips you with the tools and support you need to advance your career. Our medical billing and coding school meets your needs worldwide online, 
or in person with one-on-one -on -one support throughout your training. We are committed to helping our alumni and credentialed medical community in keeping up their certifications by offering various avenues for acquiring your continuing education units. In addition to our Mastering the Business of Medicine retreats offered several times throughout the year in different parts of the country, we now offer memberships. You can conveniently earn your CEUs by attending our exclusive members-only webinars. Since our aim is to nurture and grow the careers of individuals who work in the business of medicine, we call our member area the Apple Orchard. Advanced Coding Services. Educate. Nurture. Inspire. Reaching back with a hand up. So let's get into Newsworthy. My first Newsworthy grab bag features the fact that the month of March is dedicated to MS awareness. There's an invaluable resource in the National MS Society, and I've been mindful to include that link in my show notes below. So please take the time to read this rich resource. In multiple sclerosis, that's the body's own immune system attacking the central nervous system and causes damage, which slows or stops nerve transmission. Nearly 1 million people are living with MS in the United States, according to a study funded by the National MS Society. There are 2.8 million people worldwide living with MS. MS is three times more common among women than men and is more prevalent in women of childbearing age than in any other group. Doctors don't know for certain why MS affects more women than men. Studies point to the roles of female hormones, vitamin D, inflammation, and obesity. The fact that so many more women than men have MS suggests that sex hormones, such as testosterone and estrogen, play a role. Now, some of the causes and etiology of multiple sclerosis. Doctors do not know for certain what causes MS. Scientists believe that a combination of factors trigger this disease. Studies support the opinion that MS is caused when people with the right combination of genes are exposed to some triggers in the environment. Research also suggests that ethnicity and geography play a role. Now, to identify the cause of MS, research is ongoing in the areas of immunology, epidemiology, genetics, infectious agents. Understanding what causes MS will speed up the process of finding more effective ways to treat it and ultimately to cure it. Now, immunology and MS. In MS, an abnormal immune response causes inflammation and damage in the central nervous system. Many different cells are involved in the abnormal immune response. Two important types of immune cells are T cells and B cells. Environmental factors of MS. Scientists are continuing to learn about environmental factors that contribute to the risk of developing MS. Geography and multiple sclerosis. MS is known to occur more frequently in areas farther from the equator. Epidemiologists are looking at variations in geography, demographics, genetics, infectious causes, and migration patterns in an effort to understand why. Other studies have shown that people who move before the age of 15 tend to take on the risk level, either higher or lower of the area that they move to. Such data suggest that exposure to some environmental agent before puberty may predispose a person to develop MS later on. MS clusters. The perception that very high numbers of cases of MS have occurred in a specific time period or location may provide clues to environmental or genetic risk for this disease. So far, cluster studies in MS have not produced clear evidence for the existence of any causative or triggering factor or factors in MS. More studies are needed to confirm all of these theories. Vitamin D and multiple sclerosis. Growing evidence suggests that vitamin D plays an important role in MS. Low vitamin D levels in the blood have been identified as a risk factor for the development of MS. 
Some researchers believe that sun exposure may help to explain the north-south distribution of MS. People who live closer to the equator are exposed to greater amounts of sunlight year-round. As a result, they tend to have higher levels of naturally produced vitamin D, which is thought to support immune function and may actually help protect against immune-mediated diseases like MS. Studies of vitamin D supplementation for prevention and management of MS are underway. Smoking and MS. The evidence is also growing that smoking plays an important role in MS. Studies have shown that smoking increases a person's risk of developing MS and is associated with more severe disease and more rapid disease progression. Obesity and MS. Several studies have shown that obesity in childhood and adolescence, particularly in girls, increase the risk of later developing MS. Other studies have shown that obesity in early adulthood may also contribute to an increased risk of developing MS. Also, obesity may contribute to inflammation and more MS activity, for example, relapses and lesions on MRI scans in those already diagnosed with MS. Infectious, infectious factors of MS. Many viruses and bacteria, including measles, canine distemper, human herpes virus 6 or HHV6, Epstein-Barr virus or EBV, and chlamydia pneumonia have been or are being investigated to determine if they are involved in the development of MS. Epstein-Barr virus, the virus that causes mononucleosis or mono, has received significant attention in recent years. A growing number of research findings indicate that previous infection with EBV contributes to the risk of developing MS. This does not mean that MS is an infectious disease. MS is not an infectious disease, but latent viruses may play a role in triggering MS symptoms and disease activity. The viruses involved with MS, such as EBV and HHV6, are infectious, but MS itself is not. MS is not directly caused by germs that enter the body and is not passed from one person to another. You cannot get infected with MS. Is MS genetic or hereditary? MS is not an inherited disease. It is not passed down from generation to generation, but people can inherit genetic risk. Studies of twins have contributed to the belief that genes do play some role. In the general population, the risk of developing MS is about 1 in 334. In identical twins, if one twin has MS, the risk that the other twin will develop MS is about 1 in 4. The risk of developing MS also increases when the other first-degree family members, parents, siblings, and children have MS, but far less than, I, than in identical twins. Research is ongoing to better understand how genetic risk contributes to the development of MS. So, to raise awareness of this disease, the month of March is Multiple Sclerosis Awareness Month. It's a time to bring attention to the current state of research on MS, including new ways to diagnose and treat the condition. Throughout March, you may see orange ribbons with a butterfly symbol. Orange is the official color for MS awareness, and the butterfly represents the shape commonly seen on a magnetic resonance imaging scan or MRI scan of a brain of a person with MS. Now moving on, my second Newsworthy Grab Bag features, a breaking news update to the No Surprises Act. Now CMS has issued guidance that states, quote, on February 24, 2023, certified IDR entities or independent dispute resolution entities were instructed to resume processing payment determinations on February 27, 2023, for disputes involving items or services furnished before October 25, 2022. The standards governing a certified IDR entity's consideration of information when making payment determinations in these disputes are provided in the October 2021 Interim Final Rules 
as revised by the opinions and orders of the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Texas. Disputes involving items or services furnished before October 25, 2022 are not affected by the February 6, 2023 opinion and order of the Eastern Texas Court. Certified IDR entities will continue to hold issuance of payment determinations that involve items or services furnished on or after October 25, 2022, until the department issues further guidance. The departments are working diligently to complete necessary guidance and system updates in order to allow certified IDR entities to resume processing payment determinations for these disputes. All other federal IDR process timelines continue to apply. Therefore, disputing parties should continue to engage in open negotiations and all other aspects of the federal IDR process, including submitting fees and offers. And now, it's time for my best practice tips and trusty tip. So in today's compliance tip, I wanted to focus on the latest Comparative Billing Report, or CBR, issued on immunosuppressive drugs. Now, this is CBR number 202302. That's right, it is the second CBR for the year for 2023. Now, right now, during the end of February, as I'm recording this episode, CMS will be issuing a comparative billing report, that CBR, on rendering providers that submitted Medicare Part B claims for immunosuppressive drugs they provided. The CBR number 202302 focuses on the Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System, or HCPCS codes. J7503, J7507, J7518, and J7527, as well as the modifier KX. Now, the CBR analysis was based on claims extracted from the integrated data repository using the latest version of claims available on January 31, 2023. This analysis includes both paid and unpaid claims with dates of service from October 1, 2021 through September 30, 2022. The 2021 Medicare Fee-for-Service Supplemental Improper Payment Data Report reflects an improper payment rate of 23.7% for immunosuppressive drugs, which represents over $63 million dollars in potential improper payments. Now, the types of error that comprise the improper payment rate for Medicare Part B immunosuppressive drugs include a whopping 50.6% improper payment rate that was attributed to insufficient documentation, as well as a whopping 12.9% of improper payment rate attributed to medical necessity errors. After review of and research into the improper payment rate, this CBR was created to analyze the possible threat to the Medicare Trust Fund associated with immunosuppressive drugs, as well as modifier KX. The expectation is that providers who provide immunosuppressive drugs will maintain proper documentation for patient care and confirm correct coding processes. Now, the criteria for receiving a CBR are threefold for these types of providers. If they're number one, significantly higher compared to either peer group or national percentages in any of the three metric calculations, which means they're greater than or equal to the 90th percentile. And number two, if these providers have had at least three total patients with claims submitted for immunosuppressive drugs. And finally, third, if these providers have had at least $3,000 in total allowed charges for immunosuppressive drugs. Now let's dive into the specifics of why this CBR is issued here. So what is the modifier KX that they're wanting to look into? The modifier KX is defined in our HCPCS manual 2023 as follows. These are requirements specified in the medical policy have been met. 
And it goes on and says, quote, the provider should append modifier KX when expectations are in effect and the beneficiary qualifies for an exception. But the letter outlines some more concerns identified with this modifier KX appended to these sorts of immunosuppressive drugs, those J codes that I highlighted earlier. Now, the letter goes on and states that, quote, an August 2017 report from the Office of Inspector General, the OIG, found that Medicare Part B paid for some immunosuppressive drugs billed with the KX modifier that were not eligible for Part B payment. The report further states that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS's intention for the KX modifier was to signify an attestation by the pharmacy that it had documentation proving that a beneficiary's organ transplant occurred when the beneficiary was eligible for Medicare coverage, end quote. And then it goes on further and says, in Chapter 17, Section 80.3 of the Medicare Claims Processing Manual, CMS provides the following guidance for the use of the KX modifier. And it says, quote, the use of the KX modifier is not required. In the case of immunosuppressive drugs, submission of the KX modifier is intended for adjudicating claims when the supplier attests that it maintains documentation that the beneficiary was eligible for Medicare Part A on the date of his or her transplant, but where Medicare cannot identify a claims record indicating the transplant was paid for by fee-for-service Medicare. The additional information provided by the use of the KX modifier permits Medicare to reasonably assume that a Medicare payment for an organ transplant was made. For claims received on and after July 1 of 2008, DME Max will accept claims for immunosuppressive drugs without a KX modifier, but will deny such claims if CMS cannot identify a record of a claim indicating that the transplant was paid for by fee-for-service Medicare, end quote. Moving on. Let's dive into the HCPCS codes at issue in this CBR number 202302. There are four HCPCS codes at issue. The first is J7503 for tacrolimus, extended release, and Varsis XR, oral, 0.25 milligrams. The second HCPCS code is J7507 for tacrolimus, immediate release, oral, 1 milligram. The third HCPCS code is J7518 for mycophenolic acid, oral, 180 milligrams. And the final HCPCS code is J7527 for Iverolimus, oral, 0.25 milligrams. Now the metrics that are identified in this CBR. This report is going to be an analysis, right, of these following two metrics. The first is the percentage of immunosuppressive drug claim lines submitted per HCPCS code. And then the second metric is going to be that percentage of immunosuppressive drug claim lines submitted with the modifier KX. The CBR analysis focuses on the rendering providers with specialty A5, which is for pharmacy, that submitted claims for these immunosuppressive drugs. And statistics were calculated for each provider, all providers in the state and all providers in the nation. CBR number 202302 summarizes statistics for services with dates of service from October 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2022. Now, there are 21,427 rendering providers nationwide that have submitted claims for immunosuppressive drugs. The total allowed charges for these claims were over $235 million during the analysis timeframe. Now, remember that immunosuppressive drugs vulnerability exists, right? And according to the 2021 Medicare fee-for-service supplemental improper payment data report, right, there was an improper payment rate of 23.7% for immunosuppressive drugs, which represents over $63 million in improper payments, potentially, right? 
and they break that down even further to include a whopping 50.6% of this improper payment rate is due to insufficient documentation. And then another big number, 12.9% of this improper payment rate is due to medical necessity errors. So we have to be mindful and remember that the desired behavior for these types of immunosuppressive drugs, right? The desired behavior is always to protect the Medicare trust fund. Also, we need to be mindful to increase our provider's awareness about immunosuppressive drugs, as well as support our providers for internal compliance processes, and then provide coding guidelines and requirements. So it's critical to understand that a CBR does not indicate that you are going to get an official audit, right? Although please be mindful that this phrase on your letters is directly coming from the MACs that issue the CBRs. So take that with plenty and plenty and plenty of grains of salt, like I've said over all of these CBR episodes that I've disclosed over these two years. So more directly, consider this CBR letter to be your notice. It's your warning that you most definitely are being looked at closely. The value, though, of the CBR is huge. The value of the CBR to providers is that it serves as a tool to look at your billing patterns as compared to your peers in your state as well as across the country. The value also includes the facts that specific coding guidelines and billing information will be detailed. The CBR informs providers whose billing patterns differ from those of their peers. Now, the desired behavior here is to capture proper and compliant documentation for these types of immunosuppressive drugs, right? But has that been working? Because these numbers are too high, way too high of an error rate, in my opinion. Again, let's emphasize 50.6% was due to insufficient documentation and 12.9% was due to medical necessity errors. So best practice recommendations always include review those HCPCS codes to ensure correct code assignment. Perform those regular internal reviews of documentation and code selection to ensure accuracy and compliance because I know for a fact that these two steps alone can help reduce the possibility of improper payments. And yet again, though, insufficient documentation here is the killer, right? So what documentation do I want to see when I'm auditing for immunosuppressive drugs? Well, first of all, what are immunosuppressive drugs, you might ask, right? When are they even used? So these J codes that I outlined earlier, these J codes for J7503, for tacrolimus extended release, for Invarsis XR oral 0.25 milligrams, right? That's used to help prevent organ rejection in people who have had kidney transplants. And it's taken only one time per day. Again, right? We have to understand what that drug means, what extended release means. Uh, We have to read those boxes that the drugs come in to understand how to properly utilize, capture, and code these types of drugs on claim forms. So in general, these types of immunosuppressive drugs are used for organ rejection, right? We want to help keep those organs that were transplanted into patients in their bodies and not be rejected. So then next thing I'm always looking for, as always, are those LCDs, those local coverage determinations, those LCAs, those local coverage articles, or if there are any NCDs that are applicable, those national coverage determinations. And hey, hey, guess what? Of course, these same drugs, these same J codes that we talked about in the CBR, they do happen to fall under an LCD for, the title is pretty snazzy, immunosuppressive drugs. So it's right there. There is an LCD and there is even an LCA that is coordinating with it. So let me walk you through some of those general documentation requirements in the LCD. So in order to justify payment for DME POS items, Suppliers must meet the following requirements, right? That standard written order has to be found in the documentation. There's also all of that medical record information, including the continued need or the continued use of these drugs as they're applicable. 
And then of course, they also want to see correct coding and they also want to see that POD, that proof of delivery. So these types of documentation have to be retained. And then of course, like I just said a moment ago, there is that coordinating local coverage article as well, that LCA on immunosuppressive drugs. So the article guide, if you take the time to read that, there's article text involved that break down when non-medical necessity coverage and payment rules apply. So for any item to be covered by Medicare, it must be number one, be eligible for a defined Medicare benefit category. Number two, be reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis and treatment of illness or injury or to improve the functioning of a malformed body member and three, to meet all other applicable Medicare statutory and regulatory requirements. Information provided in this policy article relates to determinations other than those based on the Social Security Act. Then it goes on and says immunosuppressive drugs are covered under the immunosuppressive therapy benefit in the Social Security Act in 1861 S2J. In order for a beneficiary's immunosuppressive drugs to be eligible for reimbursement, the reasonable and necessary requirements set out in the related local coverage determination must be met. In addition, there are specific statutory payment policy requirements discussed below that also must be met. So make sure you read all of that fine print. Prescription drugs used in immunosuppressive therapy are covered only if all of the following criteria are met, and there are five of them, which you need to read through, right? That the transplant has met Medicare coverage criteria in effect at the time for the kidney, the heart, intestinal, liver, lung, or heart and lung transplants, as well as they have to meet those national and local medical necessity criteria, et cetera. So this is all outlined in the LCD and the LCA. So a lot of these folks who received or are going to be receiving these CBRs in the mail in the weeks ahead really need to pay attention and dig a little bit deeper into these applicable LCDs and LCAs as they pertain to you and your service lines. Now let's move on to the modifiers, right? For KX and GY, that's also outlined in this LCA. So the KX modifier must be added to the claim lines for the immunosuppressive drugs only if all of the following four requirements are met. Number one, if the supplier has obtained from the treating practitioner the specific date of the organ transplant. And number two, that the supplier is retaining this documentation of the transplant in its files. And number three, that the beneficiary was enrolled in Medicare Part A at the time of the organ transplant, whether or not Medicare paid for the transplant, and finally, fourth, that the transplant date precedes the date of service on the claim. If these four requirements are not met, the KX modifier must not be added to the claim. So all of those details and even more are outlined in the LCD and the LCA for immunosuppressive drugs. So I can't overstress that. You need to buckle down and really read those two documents that are publicly available to you. So this CBR should have all of us rendering immunosuppressive drugs really buckle down and self-audit whether we received this particular CBR in the mail or not, because it's a great time to dive deeper into your own data, help yourself and help the Medicare Trust Fund at the same time. You should be paying attention to what you are sending out the door. Is it really in compliance? Staying ahead of the curve and avoid receiving post-payment audits from the payers down the road. It's fundamental if you have Medicare as a payer to keep your eye on correct and compliant coding and billing practices and make sure that you are adhering to all of them. It's so important to make sure clinical documentation addresses and captures all indications for coverage and all medical necessity requirements, and you avoid the whopping 50.6% of this improper payment rate that's due to insufficient documentation, and then the whopping 12.9% that's due to medical necessity errors, right? So a better, smarter approach is one that's proactive and starts by painting a clear, rich, and vibrant medical picture the first time, so your certified medical coder can then abstract codes with accuracy. 
And finally, I focus season eight spark on creativity. I want this eighth season spark to be filled with our world's thought leaders, writers, artists, philosophers, everyone who inspires the need for creativity in all we strive to do. So in this week's inspiring quote, in Spark is from Dorothy Parker. Creativity is a wild mind and a disciplined eye. Absolutely true, right? I think this is an amazing quote that reminds us that to be creative requires dedicated focus as well. I think this quote reminds us that creative minds are just as dedicated to their vision, their mission, and their purpose. So let your mind drift into that more creative side of you. You'll never know just how far your ideas will go until you try. It is with our creativity that we can innovate and we can soar. I'm happy Dorothy Parker Spark still shines on in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. And as always, I appreciate you all diving into today with me. If you want more information from me, please go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. I'm wishing you all an amazing week ahead this first week of March. And don't forget that spring is just around the corner in just a few more weeks. It's on our calendars. Thank you guys so much for listening in on today's episode. And I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday. Thank you.